Hi there, guys. It's Mrs. Chappie. Welcome to U.S. History. We are on week 10. Can you believe how fast time is flying by? After today, we're only going to have two more classes left, which kind of makes me sad, but I'm looking forward to seeing you guys all again in person. Even though we won't be in a classroom together, we are going to see each other. We're going to meet up in the park. We're going to have a great picnic. We're going to pass out yearbooks. Everyone is going to get to spend time together with their friends, and I'm going to get to see your faces, so I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to continue talking today about U.S. history. We finished last week's video and last week's Zoom class, which, by the way, thank you guys so much for coming to the Zoom meeting. It's the highlight of my week when I get to see you and talk to you and see your dogs and your cats and your rooms and um, get to spend a little bit of time talking about history in person. It makes me really happy, so I really look forward to that. And thank you to those of you that are um, trudging along and watching these silly videos. I'm doing my best to share what I know about history with you in an interesting way, maybe, so that you're learning a little something. So last week, we talked, we started talking about the Civil War. And a lot of history teachers just go, this battle happened, this person won. This battle happened on this date, and this person won. And, you know, I don't care so much about dates and and particular battles, yeah, you can learn about them and they're in your book. And I'm gonna tell you about a project we were gonna do about the battles in class. But I like to think deeply. I like to think, what were the advantages? What were the disadvantages? What were the reasonings? What was different about this war than other wars? And how did it change the future? That's what I like to talk to you guys about. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So in your notebook, you have all of these, um, battle, uh, well, I guess they're called Civil War battles. You have all these Civil War battles. And if we were together, we would have made this Civil War battle um, folder. So I encourage you guys to make this at home. We can't make it together. So I hope that you do that. You cut out the Civil War battle. On the inside, you glue the Gettysburg Address. And then each on the inside, you make a different um, card for each of the particular battles. Can you see how I'm doing that there? Um, this one, for example, is the battle, the battle of Gettysburg. And it has all the facts about the Battle of Gettysburg. And when you cut it out, you pull this summary that you're gonna make. Who was there? What happened? Where did it happen? When did it happen? And what were the results? So this is getting you all your, your battle information. And I'm not gonna go over all this because you can do this at home. So, and then when you have all your different battles, they go together into a folder. And there you have your Civil War. Bada bing, bada boom. This was um, one of my students, you can see, Jay Chopra, uh, from when he took U.S. history. He must have taken it several years ago, the last time I taught it. So, I found this in my pile. I will give it to him so he can finish it. Obviously, he was absent on the day we finished it. As I can tell, his aren't finished on the inside, but I'm going to return that to him. So what we're going to talk about today, let me go ahead and share my screen. I like to do that with you. Screen share. Here we go. And I have, of course, some Mr. Betts videos to talk to you about, but we're going to pick up where we left off in the PowerPoint. I'm assuming we finished talking about women. And voila, here we go. So what I want to talk about is how was this war, how was the Civil War different from other wars? Um, mankind has been fighting battles for forever. But the Civil War was kind of a turning point in the way that war was fought. There were different realities. Things happened differently. And the Civil War was that turning point. Today, in our society, we've had another turning point. When the United States is in conflicts with other countries and there's different things that happen, we now use drones. Did you know that? Instead of people fighting hand to hand. Um, so war is continuing to change. So in the past, before the Civil War, it was that hand-to-hand -hand combat where it was one soldier against another soldier, and they were fighting up close and personal. And that changes in the Civil War because they had different weapons. 
in the past, they had to use muskets, which weren't very accurate from very far away. You had to be really, really close to someone to be able to hurt them with a musket. Well, in the Civil War, they had rifles for the first time, and rifles are more accurate from a long distance away. So that's a huge change. And now, as I mentioned a minute ago, that's even changed more today where we don't use rifles so much in war anymore. We now use drones. So war is continuing to change. Um, cannons were actually used also in the Civil War, and that was a big difference. So we'll talk in a little bit about how photography came about during the Civil War. So this is the first war we're going to actually have photographs, hard photographs of. If you continue studying American history, the Vietnam War was the first war where there was live really reporting. And then today we have the coronavirus, which our president talks about as being a war against an invisible enemy. And we're seeing it on the news 24 hours a day. So we're seeing how things change over time. And the Civil War being one of those really turning points. This shows the manufacturing change we talked about in the last class, how there was interchangeable parts, and so they were able to produce weapons more on a large scale. So this shows some manufacturing happening. And I wanted to uh, also talk to you about the way that they fed the troops and how that changed. So they developed something in the Civil War, well, they'd been using it before that on ships and stuff, called hardtack. And hardtack is, uh, we would eat it together if we were in class. I always make it for my students, but you guys, you're going to have to just imagine it. It's just flour and water, and it turns into this really, really hard biscuit. And in the Civil War, they would dip it in their coffee um, to kind of soften it up. Sometimes it would be so full of bugs that when they would dip it in, the bugs would float off, and so that was yucky. I thought this was kind of a cool video because this shows a piece of hardtack, what they would eat in the Civil War, at, in a museum. So let's go ahead and take a look at this video real quick. I'm Matt Anderson, a curator with the Minnesota Historical Society. While the Society's primary goal is to document everyday life in the state, we do have a few items in our collection that fall just a bit outside of the ordinary. One of the most bizarre pieces in our collection is this item right here. It's a piece of genuine Civil War era hardtack. Anyone who's done even the slightest research into the war certainly knows about hardtack. It was the Army's primary foodstuff, both North and South. Essentially, it's a large, thick cracker. Army officials love the stuff. It was simple and inexpensive to produce, requiring only flour, salt, and water. It was reasonably nutritious, and it lasted forever. Consider that this piece is 150 years old and probably looks just as good as it ever did. Long-lasting food was important to the military. The armies were always on the move, and hardtack could be produced in central bakeries and then shipped out to the troops in large quantities. It didn't matter how long it took to reach them, nor how long the stuff remained in storage, either back at the bakery or up on the battlefront. If it wasn't stored properly, hardtack could get moldy, but it was issued just the same. The men would simply cut away the mold or dunk their hardtack into coffee to kill any insects that might be living inside. The coffee served another purpose, too. Hardtack was notoriously tough to chew. Soldiers were fond of calling the crackers toothbreakers. Hot coffee softened the bread and made it a bit more palatable. Other soldiers might fry their hardtack with bacon grease or wet it into a dough to cook over a fire. Normally we don't keep food items as part of the society's collection. We don't want anything that might attract pests. Note that our hardtack is in a sealed bag, making sure that it'll survive for another 150 years easy. Okay, that was just kind of a little fun uh, video that I had for you on hardtack, which is what they ate in the Civil War, because it was cheap, nutritional, and easy to transport. So the next topic, so we, we talked about um, the new realities, how war changed, we talked about how people ate. Uh, the next thing I wanted to do was to talk to you guys just for a little bit about um, medical care 
And medical care did not advance as far as the weaponry. The weaponry got, got better during the Civil War in that they had the rifles and the can cannons, but the medical care did not. Civil War doctors really didn't get what caused infections. They didn't understand the role of germs and um, the importance of being clean. We hear all the time, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Um, in our pandemic right now, we're washing our hands all the time. They were not washing their hands during the Civil War. So the hospital tents were really dirty. I just said they didn't wash their hands. Infections spread rapidly. In fact, more people actually died from infections than they did, let's move me over here, than they did um, from injuries. So often if a, a soldier in the Civil War was injured, he would not want to go to the hospital tent because he thought, okay, I just got shot. If I go to the hospital tent, I'll die for sure. But if I don't go, then maybe I'll survive my injury of being shot. So a lot of times soldiers would just refuse that treatment because this, the soldiers were dying from the diseases they got, from the infections they got, uh, more so than the actual um, injury that was caused. Uh, here's a fun statistic for you. Well, it's not fun, it's kind of sad. Three, um, died, three people died of typhoid and pneumonia for everyone that died in battle. So a lot of the deaths were caused by these diseases. So I have just for you a little quick picture of, or a drawing of kind of what a Civil War hospital might have looked like. And because this was the time that photographs came out, you can actually see a photograph of a hospital. And you can kind of see the misery and all the people laying there and it looks dirty, right? They're on the ground, they're in the dirt, it's definitely not sanitary. They're definitely not practicing social distancing like in our pandemic. We've heard a lot about the importance of staying six to 10 feet apart from people. If you see on the news pictures of hospitals that are set up to deal with the people that are sick right now, they have beds that are set 10 feet apart. You look at this photograph and they're just lying on top of each other. For fun, I thought I'd show you a doctor's kit from the Civil War and you can see that it was used often for amputations. So if someone had an injury because they knew it would get infected, because they knew that injury would kill them, they would often amputate the, the limb, the arm or the leg. So we have saws, things such as that. So as we go about the Civil War, and when you work on your um, Civil War battles, you'll see that there was a particular turning point in the war where the emphasis of the war had changed. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've talked about the differences between the North and the South. And last week, we spent a lot of time talking about how the South was very concerned about their state's rights and the North was very concerned about preserving the Union and that the original, the initial um, purpose of the Civil War, while they were motivated by slavery, they put the reason behind the Civil War as being, um, we want to preserve the Union or we want to have our own state's rights. Well, the, the reason for the war turned when this happened. This is called the Emancipation Proclamation. This is the picture that I have of it right there. And it has Abraham Lincoln because Abraham Lincoln issued this proclamation. And it's very small. You can see right there, this is kind of a replica of it and how small the proclamation is. But the Emancipation Proclamation is super important because it was the act of freeing people from slavery. Abraham Lincoln issued this order and said, all slaves in the South are now free. Now at the beginning of the war, he didn't make it really about slavery. He said, our reason for the war is to um, preserve the Union. Mind you, he thought slavery was wrong and he was opposed to slavery. But even when Abraham Lincoln was first elected, he said, I won't stop slavery. It wasn't until after the war broke out that he did issue this emancipation, I can't even say it, emancipation proclamation where he said slavery will be ended. So while he said that originally, the purpose of the war is to save the Union and not to save or destroy slavery. This Emancipation Proclamation 
changed it. That's why I said there was a change. There was a different direction. So Abraham Lincoln said, as the war goes on, clearly that's the underlying reason for everything is this view of slavery and the view that this what the South was doing was wrong. So he issues this proclamation in January 1863. Its uh, proclamation is a formal order um, that this formal order says all slaves in the Confederate States are now free. And so this changed the whole purpose of the war to be this crusade, this, um, this mission for freedom. And it includes in there that idea that Thomas Jefferson said when we first talked about the founding of our country, that all men are created equal. And this war was about living up to those words, that all men are going to be created equal. This is kind of a, um, this is actually a postcard, but it is of the Emancipation Proclamation. And you have Abraham Lincoln there as our center character creating this freedom. And that's why when little kids learn about Abraham Lincoln, even you guys, when I'm talking to you about Abraham Lincoln, everyone's first thing is like, oh yeah, I know Abraham Lincoln. He freed the slaves. And that's how he did it was through this proclamation, the Emancipation Proclamation. So as the war goes on, I want to talk to you about um, how you're going to continue to get people to fight in it. To get people to fight in it, both sides had to have this thing called a draft. And a draft is what you do when you do not have enough volunteers. Now, last week we talked about when the Civil War started, the first thing both sides said is we want volunteers. And they had volunteers. Everyone thought the war was going to be really short. They were all on board and lots of people signed up to volunteer. But what do you do when you don't have enough soldiers, when you don't have enough people to fight? That's when you have something called a draft. And both sides um, use this because they did not have enough people. Now, the first, the first person to use it was the Confederacy, and they passed this draft law in 1862. And what a draft is, is it's making people have to be part of the military. They have to fight in the war. It's this system of requiring citizens to join the armed forces. And lots of countries have drafts, um, not just the Union, not just the Confederacy, not just the United States. We have not drafted anyone into the military since the Vietnam War. So it has continued to happen after the Civil War. There has been a draft in the United States, but not since the uh, Vietnam War, which was way before I was born. But in the United States, we still require every person who's 18 to sign up for the draft. Um, or I should rephrase that, every male who's over 18 to sign up. So the Confederacy, um, drafted made every man between 18 and 35 uh, to join their military for a period of three years. The North did something very similar, but instead of 18 to 35, it was 20 to 45, a little different age in that. Um, what was unique in the Civil War, which we don't do today and we did not do in the Vietnam War, is under both laws, if if you were um, a wealthy person and you were drafted to go into the military, you could actually pay someone to go take your place for you. So a draft is, is where you choose kind of, um, it's almost like a lottery where you choose a certain person to come. It's not every single person. Every person has to register and then you, they pick a certain number of them to be in the military. So because they could pay people to um, take their spot, this was called a rich man's war and a poor man's plight. So if you were poor, you had to go fight. If you were rich, you can get out of it. In the Vietnam War, if you were in school, you could be deferred, meaning you didn't have to be drafted. So again, if you were rich enough to send your child to school, then your child would not be drafted. But if you couldn't afford school and you were out working, then you could. So a lot of people criticize the Vietnam War because of that, similar to that. 
So we talked about the Emancipation Proclamation as being where the enslaved people in the South were freed by Abraham Lincoln. He's very well known for his Emancipation Proclamation. The other thing that he's known for is this thing called the Gettysburg Address. When you do this, one of the battles is the Battle of Gettysburg. And after the Battle of Gettysburg, there were so many people who had died literally on the battlefield that they had to bury them right there and the battlefield became a cemetery. And so Abraham Lincoln goes to Gettysburg where this battle had been fought and he dedicates the cemetery. It's common to give kind of a speech when you open up a cemetery or when you open up a business, it's a dedication. And that's what the Gettysburg Address was, was actually a dedication to this cemetery. Oh, I said that, dedication of a cemetery. It took place four months after the battle. It took that long to collect the wound, the, the dead and to bury them. Um, they, the men were buried there, I said that. There were about 1,500 people who were at that cemetery. That's a whole lot that died. And what's really meaningful about this address that Abraham Lincoln gave, gave is he restated, he echoed, he emphasized the words of the Declaration of Independence. Now, if I were with you guys right now, I'd go, who's gonna raise their hand and tell me some of those words? Those words, they're on my wall. Can you see them right there? See, I keep them in my office, they're so important. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable law rights, among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So I brought that into the classroom before because it hangs on my wall. And they're such important words to me because it's the foundation of our country. And in the Gettysburg Address, Abraham Lincoln repeated those words. He made those, those points again. Um, if we were together, we would actually look at the Gettysburg Address. It is in your notebook. And it is going to be pasted. It's not very long, it's pretty short. In fact, so many people were there to hear him speak that he got up on stage, he stood up. And remember, this is when cameras were invented and people were getting the, ca the camera ready to take a picture of him giving the Gettysburg Address. And he spoke and it was so short that he was done and sat down and the reporters and people that were there were like, hold it, we're not even ready. What, what, you're done already? but he just kept it short and sweet and to the point. That is a illustration. No, that actually, is that a photograph? I can't even tell. No, that's an illustration of what he, what he looked like. And that's another illustration. So um, we're continuing to kind of move through the Civil War here. We're talking about what medical care was like. We talked about how they got soldiers in the draft. We talked about how there were new realities of war. They fought war differently. There were also some techno technological firsts during the Civil War that made the Civil War different than any war that had ever happened. Now, for hundreds and hundreds of years, wars had been kind of fought similarly. Of course, there had been changes. We talked about the French and Indian War, how that was different than they used to fought, fight over in Britain, where they would have lines that, that um, marched upon each other, and how this was more what we call guerrilla warfare, where they were hiding behind things. So war continued to change, but the Civil War is where it really, really changed. They had railroads, they had trains for the first time. They were able to move troops on the trains. They were able to keep the troops supplied. Now from last week, we knew, we learned that that really, really helped the North. And for the first time, they were able to communicate long distances. They used telegraphs to communicate with the armies. Um, and for the first time, war was recorded. The first photograph was taken, I put these fun facts in there in 1827, but it wasn't until about 1850 that photographs really got better, which was kind of neat. Um, and they had, for the first time, combat ships. They were armor-plated steamships, which now we see on the news aircraft carriers and a lot of ships are used in uh, military actions all the time, but it really got used for uh, really big time during the Civil War because they started covering them with armor so that they weren't like in the War of 1812 or 
the French and Indian War, or different wars where ships were made out of wood and could easily be burned or hit with cannonballs. So I have an old Civil War picture for you just for fun to show you a train from that period. Um, a lot of people like to reenact things from the Civil War, historians who are really interested in that. This shows a telegraph operator. This is obviously modern, but he's dressed in Civil War garb. People do that for fun. They dress up like that. It's kind of like some of my friends, some of you guys have told me who are really into Comic-Con and you dress up like your Comic-Con characters and you go to different conventions and stuff. Some of you showed me your pictures doing that. This is what these guys are doing, but it's all about Civil War instead of um, Japanese anime characters. Here's an illustration of a, of a um, ship covered with the sides with plating to protect it, the USS Alexandria. It's around 1864. So as the war pro progresses, the Union, the North, is starting to make headway. If we study our battles, we can see that they that at first the Union lost because the South was so committed, but now the Union's starting to create problems for the Confederate Army. There was the blockade. We had talked about that was being the um, Anaconda plan where they kind of crushed it. Stuff became expensive. They couldn't sell stuff. Their tobacco or their cotton, they weren't able to sell. They weren't wearing out of clothes. I told you guys all this story about Scarlett O'Hara from the movie Gone with the Wind how she was in Georgia and how she didn't have her goods. I told you that story last week and how she took a um, curtain down to make a dress in the movie. And this is a picture of her wearing her dress made out of curtains from the movie Gone with the Wind. So ultimately, we know the war ends and we know who wins the Union. We're all part of the United States of America. We're not part of the Confederate States and we don't have slavery. So spoiler alert, we, we know that the Union prevails. Um, but it was Grant who had the plan to end the war. He's like, this has got to come to an end. And I'm going to engage in what he called all the art of war. And I'm going to do this by finding the enemy. I'm going to get to the enemy as soon as possible. I'm going to strike hard and as often as I can. And I'm going to keep on moving. And he believed in this idea of total war. And if you watch some movies um, like Gone with the Wind, for example, that are set in the South, you see Grant's March. You see just the South being destroyed because that was Grant's plan. He said, I'm going to engage in total war. I'm going to hit hard. I'm going to hit often, and I'm going to prevail. And sure enough, we know the end. Um, he did prevail. And the whole idea is to stop the South from being able to support their army. So as the Civil War moves on, Abraham Lincoln was elected before the war started. He is reelected. He continues um, to be president in 1864. He ran against someone named George McLean that uh, urged that the war needed to end, whereas Lincoln was like, no, he had made it about slavery with the Emancipation Proclamation. So he gets reelected. Grant in the South is continuing to march. He captures Atlanta. His whole purpose is to um, like we have talked about over and over again, to destroy the ability of the South to get their supplies. He also destroyed everything of value and pretty much made this huge destructive path for about 30 mi uh, about 60 miles. When I was in the South um, this summer, I was able to go along the same path that he had been, and there were actually billboards that were put up along the road describing it. The movie Gone with the Wind depicts it. We've talked about that movie a couple of times. Just thought I would show you um, their, what do you call it? The movie marquee, the billboard for the movie, has all this fire behind it because that's depicting that march that burned everything. So finally, 
the war comes to an end after a nine month battle in um, the gateway to Richmond. Richmond is the capital of the South. And there'd been this battle that'd been going on for a long time. And ultimately the unions, the Union, the North breaks through the Confederate lines and captures the city. And once they capture that capital of the city, that means they won. It's kind of like um, capture the flag and you've got their flag or you're playing soccer and you finally get your ball into their, the, your opponent's goal and you score. When you take your enemy's capital, that's like the ultimate sign that you're gonna prevail. And so once they took Richmond, uh, we know that the war is gonna end. So the two generals are General Grant and General Lee and um, General Grant from the North surrounds General Lee's army and generally says, oh my goodness, there's nothing left for me to do except for go and talk to General Grant and surrender. And there's nothing, I, I'd rather die a thousand deaths than go out and do that. So Lee gets on his full dress uniform. He's wearing his full uniform and he goes off to talk to General Grant. Um, he goes to a place, it's a city called, or I guess I wrote down village, but it's called a Patamonix Courthouse. And when I was young and I'm like, oh yeah, the Civil War ended at a Patamonix Courthouse. That's where it ended. I thought they were actually in a courthouse. I, when I was your age, I pictured them walking into a courthouse, like where a trial would be or something. And this is where I thought that that um, generally surrendered to General Grant. Well, when I got older, I realized the name of the town was a Patamonix Courthouse. So courthouse is in the name of the town. It's not a building within it. So I don't know, maybe you won't be as confused as I was for a long time. I swear I thought they were in a courthouse building until I was probably um, in college. Um, so General Lee comes in, he's all fully dressed in his full uniform. General Grant on the other side, his uniform's a mess, he's covered in mud, he's been out in, in, in the battlefield and um, the two men come together and General Lee surrenders. Now, when you surrender in a battle, you usually come to terms. It's like, okay, um, you're going to arrest these people. You're going to execute those people. You're going to take all of this. Um, you're going to do this. You're going to do that. And they come to terms like that. But the terms are very different. Um, General Grant says the Confederate soldiers can just go home. They can go home as long as they promise not to fight anymore. He didn't arrest them. He didn't execute them. He didn't put them in um, prison. He just said, go home. And I think that's a neat kind of reflection of where um, our president, the president Abraham Lincoln goes, is it's all about reuniting the union. Um, yes, there was a war and yes, the South um, was defeated. But even from the beginning of the surrender, there were making steps towards that reunification. And so uh, Lee's told that the soldiers can go home. They can take their horses, they can take their mules, they even gave them food and sent them on their way. Um, the officers got to keep their weapons, which is highly unusual. It's like these people were just fighting us and now you're letting them go home and they're getting to take their swords and their guns with them. Uh, and I said they sent them food to go home with. So the Union Army, now they've won, they start celebrating, of course, right? It seems like, yay, we've been in this long battle for so long and we, we've prevailed. When they started celebrating and whooping it up, the first thing Grant told them to do was, hey guys, you need to stop that. These are our brothers. This, these are our, the war is over. These are our countrymen. Um, they were rebels and they were wrong, but they're our countrymen again. And so we need to be united and we don't need to be rubbing it in their face quite like that. So I think that speaks a lot towards um, General Grant and towards the steps that were then gonna come to try and reunify the Union. This is a illustration of it. Fun fact, Abraham Lincoln's son was actually in the room when this happened. 
And so when he goes home to Washington, D.C., Abraham Lincoln's like, okay, tell me, tell me exactly what happened, who said what, who did what, how did it happen? Um, and so just a little fun historical fact there for you. So now that the war is over, as historians, when we look back at it, obviously you go, it, it eliminated slavery, it got rid of a great wrong, um, it preserved the Union. It said that Abraham Lincoln was a great leader. But what do else do historians look at this and what do they say? They sometimes call it the Great Furnace because in a way, one country was burned away and a whole new country had to be um, created in its place. Um, when I say a whole country was burned away, we had a, a country whose economy, a huge part of the economy, was built on enslaved labor. And now we have to recreate a country, to use terms that I hear all the time on the news today, had to reopen the country, had to open it for business again in a whole different way without slavery. And what is that going to look like? So the war burns away one country and forged a new country in its place. And a lot of people, if if I were with you right now, I'd be talking particularly with my older students about is that new country still being forged? Does it, has it, have we completely gotten past that or do we still have remnants of that that we're dealing with? And when we Zoom uh, with my older class, um, we will definitely be talking about that, particularly with my classes who are on Friday. Another thing about the Civil War, it was our first truly modern war. Um, it had the technology from the Industrial Revolution. It had interchangeable parts. It had that legacy of Eli Whitney, where weapons could be mass produced and transported on railway, with railroads and things such as that. And even though we we burned away an old country and we created a new country, that conflict about states' rights continues to until today. We see that even today on the news today when we're talking about the coronavirus and whether or not um, certain businesses should be closed and whether the state should decide that for themselves or whether the government should decide that and what's in the best interest of everyone. So that's something that continues on. And we continue on African-Americans today. Um, when the coronavirus a statistic has just come out in the last week or so that more people of color, more people of African-American heritage are becoming much sicker from the coronavirus. And it's not that they are more susceptible to the coronavirus, it's that they are having less access to good health care. And because of that, they are becoming sicker. It's not that a certain group of people catches the disease more often. It's just when they catch it, they are, are, are sicker from it. So that's continuing today. And that's it. That's the end that I have for you on, um, on the Civil War. Next week, we're going to talk about... Uh, that rebuilding of the country, that recreating it, and how that's looked. It's a co process called reconstruction. And then our last week, we're going to talk about some new industries that develop. So I do have some uh, videos for you. Um, I'm thinking about playing them right here, but I think I won't. I think I'll just put the links down so that you can um, look at the links and watch them. And I think that's all that I have to say. I hope you do complete this project because it is it is good. I like the coloring. Make sure you color it accurately. Um, he was trying to color blue here. You could probably add some extra blue there. And if you do that, I'll look forward to seeing that. Maybe I'll take a picture and send it to me. So I hope you guys are staying safe, staying healthy, washing your hands, staying inside flattening the curve, all those things that we hear about in the news all the time. And I will look forward to seeing you guys all on Thursday. Thursday's now become my favorite day of the week because that's when I get to see you all. So take real care and I shall see you guys soon. Bye now.